Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Voices for Change 2.0, the mental health podcast that's changing the discussion one voice at a time. Featuring guests that will help end the stigma and keep talking mental health. And now, here are your hosts, Rebecca and Joe Lombardo. Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Voices for Change 2.0. Yeah, how's it going, guys? Thanks for tuning in. Uh, it's the middle of May. I uh, can't believe it's already the middle of May. Yeah. Uh, the weather's finally breaking, at least, you know, Midwest here where we're at. Um you know, Detroit area and, and whatnot. Uh, it's actually been, well, it was pretty hot yesterday. Yeah, it was, surprisingly. It was warm. And, uh, you know, flowers are popping, allergies are kicking in, <laughs> um, sure. you name it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's. I don't know about you, babe, but it's, it's having a uh, bit of a positive effect on me. You know, it's like a little bit of a breath of fresh air. You know, even though I actually prefer cooler temperatures it's a nice i guess respite to what we've been going through you know it makes it mm-hmm. a little easier to go outside and want to work on the yard you know or uh you know not not so much the barbecuing because i could do that year round but yeah you know just being able to go out and take a breath of fresh air and go <sighs> you know so and that's nice and being able to have the windows open is really nice too yeah, uh-huh. that I would have to agree with you on. I I don't. It, it was it was hot yesterday, so I don't agree with you on the breath of fresh air part because it was it was just humid and bleh. <laughs> but, well, yeah. Uh, well, we had a lot of rain too. So yeah. There's that. Um, but uh, so one thing that uh, we've been kind of kicking around you, you know you guys usually hear us talking about movies and tv shows and stuff that we like mm-hmm. and uh we haven't watched any new movies lately so or tv shows yeah so we're looking for some recommendations out there uh so if you want to hit us up on our on our twitter uh it's at voices for j uh voices for change rj <laughs> I boofed that, didn't I? Um, <laughs> Voices for Change. Voices for Change, RJ. And uh, use the hashtag KeepTalkingMH. And, you know, if you got a recommendation of a movie or a TV show, uh, please, by all means, go there, post it. You know, we, we're real curious to see what uh, what you guys come up with. Absolutely. So. And as far as I'm concerned, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I was recently put on a well it's it, yeah i did it's, get a new medication and yeah. a boosting of another medication and please forgive me if i sound like i'm kind of out of it today because um it's not wearing off <laughs> very very well <laughs> um it, i'm uh, I got up to uh, 300 milligrams of trileptal, and I was also put on temazepam because I'm not sleeping. And now it's the reverse. Right now yeah. I'm now I'm really sleeping. Yeah. So <laughs> now now you're not waking. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So bear with us today on the show. Um, and uh, you know, one- if, if anybody wants to talk about meds. Feel free to to message me. Um, I would love to hear your experiences with both of those medications and um, whether or not you get, got to a point where it started to wear off a little bit. Yeah, and the other thing to remember too, really quick before we we get into our guest, is uh, that you know it's on us to be just as involved in our care and our medication as it is uh, the doctor. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if something's working or not working, you know, you have to be able to actually go to your 
doctor or psychiatrist, what what have you, and say, hey, this is working, this isn't working. Can we try something different? Can we boost this up? You know, like like Beck and, and I did for her stuff um, a couple of weeks back. You know, just it's something that we have to constantly be in touch with as, you know, people that deal with mental illness. Mm-hmm. Um, and know. I'm I'm really lucky with with my doctor. Mm-hmm. Um, we've been doing video sessions, which is great. I I love not having to leave the house <laughs> to, to see her. Um, I it's, wish we could keep it up after the whole mess that we're in now. I wish we could keep doing it that way. Yeah, it, it's actually helped your anxiety a little bit on leaving the house. Yeah, yeah, it definitely has. But you know. on the on the flip side, I'm not leaving the house. So yeah. so there's that. So you know the I'm not challenging myself yeah. to get out there and but now is not really the time for that yeah, you exactly. know so yeah so moving right along mm-hmm. moving right along uh we're honored to have today's guest on our show especially considering we broadcast from an lgbtq network our guest is a doctor a mental health advocate and a transgender woman but these traits don't define her they just contribute to the beautiful human that she is Please welcome Dr. Emmy J. Hi, this is um, Hi. this is Emmy. Hey, y'all! It's nice to talk to you. It's nice to have you on the show. Thanks for taking the time out from your day to to talk with us and be with us and and you know try and help break down some stigma and uh, stuff. <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate the work that you're doing here and. Um, in fact, I've spent some time since I, I first had some interaction with Rebecca um, on Twitter is where I ran into to Rebecca and this um, this whole um, uh, Voices for Change 2.0 that, that you're trying to do. And I mean, quite frankly, um, even aside from the topical elements where, you know, we find intersections for mental health with you know, um, the LGBTQ community, um, I think aside from the actual material intersections, there's a whole lot of um, symbiosis between the types of struggles that that we deal with. And, turn, you know, something that Rebecca had just said is getting out and challenging um, herself. And I can relate to that because the few times that I have been out to get to the pharmacy and things like that, there was some internal dissonance that I didn't recognize until later in hindsight that really had to do with a loss of um, my routine of, and my confidence in that routine as a trans woman in a cisgender world. And, you know, just going out and about and doing my day-to-day things, things that I started to take for granted after some period of time um, into my transition, you know, it just sort of becomes more natural you have to think less consciously about everything and what you're doing and, and stuff like that. So it's, it's been interesting to get out these few times and, and feel some of those old demons that, that used to haunt me that, that I ultimately was able to defeat, I think over time by being challenged by them routinely. And Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, I, I, you know, the big picture here is that I I see a lot of, I, I read a lot of um, some things on, on, Rebecca's blog, and um, I actually have um, several people very close to me um, um, who are diagnosed with BPD and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, I I spend a lot of time talking with them. Um, One of them is a very close friend of mine that that I I was having coffee with um, pretty routinely until 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 all this. (laughs) Until all of this, yeah. Yeah. So, So I thought it was a good fit for me to come on today and you know, the LGBTQ community and, you know, the trans community, um, I think, probably have a lot of um, experience and um, whether positive or negative with um, different challenges to our mental health and just, you know, and there's different dimensions to that. And hopefully today I'll be able to share some of that with you. That's, Absolutely. Yeah, that's our hope, too. And, um, you know, we, we do have questions for you, uh, I want to take a minute to 
apologize if anything that we ask uh, comes off as, as wrong or uninformed or anything. Uh, you know, Beck and I are both cisgender, and we, you know, just genuinely want to get a better understanding for ourselves and for any of our listeners that are cisgender as well. So we've never we've never really had a transgender guest. No. So this is new territory for us and we're really delighted to have you on because um it's what's most important to us is is learning new things uh, about communities that we may not have anything to, to do with necessarily uh, you know on a on a regular basis mm-hmm. and so that's yeah really i understand important, that really important to us yeah so yeah and, and i know and i get the sense that you're coming at this in good faith and so i got that sense from the get-go and which is why i agreed to do it and i know that these conversations are important um that they that they still need to be had um in a lot of ways for people to really get the human element of this and for trans to not just be an idea that, that maybe you read about in a book or a newspaper article, or, you know, even, even a, even a good profile, even a, even a well done profile doesn't give you the same sense of, of the humanity of just having a conversation. And so I, you know, part of whenever I transitioned and came out and um, started down this road, um, one thing that I saw that, that I was um, probably going to be able to do um, effectively was, was use my voice in that kind of way. I've, I've spent the, the 25 or so years between the onset of puberty and um, coming out and, and accepting my, re-accepting myself um, as trans. Um, I spent a lot of that time in, you know, um, insulated worlds um in terms of just you know getting through um you know having a family going you know going to work every day um just those basic types of things and so i didn't have a huge social life i haven't had as much of a social life for a long time um after i mm-hmm. stopped having a necessity to socialize outside of my career with people in gendered spaces, which is unfortunately the way that, that the cisgender world is sort of divided in a lot of ways, um, Mm -hmm. in a lot of places, not all, but, but in a lot of ways, there's this idea that, you know, you go to a birthday party and for, for one of your, your children's friends and the, you know, there's automatic gender, gender segregation that happens. And, you know, having those same conversations over and over in a way that is really just to try and fit into a world that I was told as a child I had to do, um, it, it, it gets exhausting. It's it's unbelievably exhausting. So in some ways, um, my passion is fueled by a lot of silence in my life, if that makes sense. I guess that's what I'm trying to say is that... <laughs> You know, I think it's a tax on a lot of LGBTQ people's mental health to have to always have these conversations. But yeah. I volunteer my energy to do it because I do find that there's importance in the conversation. And I feel like it's a way that I can sort of um, flip that privilege that I've, you know, that privilege of silence and that privilege of, of um you know, quiet around and at least be more vocal for the rest of my life. It's an awesome outlook, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, the thing I know for me, certainly I'm, uh, I approach, I try and approach everything from a humanity point of view versus an idea, you know, how does the, how does this situation or that situation impact me as a person or impact how will it impact my wife how will it impact my mother different things like that um you know so when people just for a quick example and i don't want to turn things political by any means but when you hear about things like the government wanting to say cut social security you know my wife's on disability my mother is retired you know for both of them that's their only source of income so 
when the government talks in abstracts about wanting to cut Social Security, I'm like, all right, how is that going to impact them? How is that going to impact anybody else? Our lives. Our li- our lives, other people's lives that are also relying on Social Security. So when you start to put it in those terms, or even what we're dealing with with coronavirus now, and I know we, Becca, I know we talked yeah. about that we weren't going to yeah. talk about it, but – you know, they talk about the testing and, and staying in and wearing masks and all this. It's like, well, yeah, like I, I'm an essential worker. I don't want to bring that home to my family. So I'm doing everything I can to keep them protected, mm-hmm. you know, and that's the thing that people don't realize, you know, is, you know, there was a, a video that I saw where, you know, this guy was wanting to open up the country and, and the interviewer said, well, how many people – are you know how how many accept, uh, acceptable deaths would you take to open the country mm-hmm. 70 7 700 and the guy says 70 and then from around a corner 70 members of his family come walking around mm. and he's like that's my family and the interviewer says now how many do you think would be acceptable to die to open the economy he's like none mm-hmm. so it's situations like that that people don't realize is when you actually put a face to a situation when you make it personal that's when it needs to count you know so many things are talking abstracts but when you make it personal people see more of how that's going to impact the next person you know and that's an important thing that i think is lost in this day and age mm-hmm. yeah and that's part of the reason that you know again i'd reiterate that that i you know, reached out to Rebecca to ask her if um, she'd be interested in doing something like this, because um, I'm also a professor of engineering, and um, I can relay a story to you about this. It was, um, I think it was last semester, it was in the fall, um, and we, we for several semesters, had a um, trans guy on campus, um, and he was in engineering and stuff, and so sort of di- didn't get the opportunity to, to teach him directly, but taught a lot of his friends and things like that. And, you know, there was a conversation I had one day with um, with some of his, his friends, and, you know, one of them looked at me, and he says, you know, well, you know, I didn't really understand it first, but, you know, I just kind of went with it, um, almost like you're saying, like, given given the the humanity element, the benefit of the doubt here. Um, Here's Mm -hmm. a real person standing in front of me saying, this is who they are. So Mm -hmm. I'm going to take that for face value and move forward on that bit of information. And, you know, eventually, and this is again, being reiterated, being, you know, told to me secondhand, um, he says, eventually, you know, we just realized that he was just one of the guys. And so I don't even think any of us thought any more about him being trans after that. And it just sort of reminded me and reiterated to me that, um, you know, one of the easiest ways to, to, you know, build alliances between cisgender people and transgender people is for cis people to have interactions and just, you know, humanistic experiences with us. Right. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Agreed. Definitely. So, <laughs> and, and, and if you this... if you don't mind, I, I'd also mm-hmm. say that that's that's part of what drives. Um, you know, I would say for me, one of the biggest mental health challenges, um, you know, aside from COVID and all this kind of stuff that's that's really pushing pressure on everyone. Aside from all that, one of the biggest mental health challenges for me, as a trans woman, is waking up day after day and having everyone from the mainstream media to um, the people on Twitter or the people on Facebook or wherever it may be wanting to engage in debate about my life. And, Mm -hmm. you know, what I find is that, you know, probably in 99% of those cases, those people don't know a trans person personally, or they've never had even an acquaintanceship or a, a social interaction with a trans person. So to them, what it ends, you know, and that's, that's nobody's fault. Um, trans people are a, a, a small um, fraction of the population. And so therefore the probability 
of interaction and things like this is, of course, you know, generally speaking, pretty low. And not every trans person wants to, you know, just tell everyone around them that they're trans. And, you know, we can say that this is a, a feedback loop that, that creates these conditions itself. But what I can say is that it goes back to that same idea that you were relating to, you know, the person whose family was presented to them or your wife and your mother and just discussions of these, these abstract ideas of like cutting social security or whatever it may be. Well, you know, debating whether, you know, trans people can exist in society, you know, is a, it's an assault on my mental health every time I see someone doing it, because it, it just tells me that they've probably been inundated with different um, sources of subconscious bias and, um, societal transphobia, whether it was the Jerry Springer show in the 90s or, you know, um, comedians or, you know, there's all sorts of these sources of transphobia that that are in popular culture that sort of reinforce the idea that it's okay and that trans people are something to be mocked and made fun of. And so it just snowballs into this idea that, well, all of the worst things that people have ever said about trans people, it's easier to buy into if you don't actually know one. Yeah, I would definitely agree with you there. I, I, like I said before, I never actually known a trans person and um, it's never, it was never a, a situation where I thought any, you know, negative thought it was just that maybe perhaps a, a trans person didn't um come forth in in my world you know what i mean it, they didn't um yeah yeah make it known that that's the situation that was going on in their life and um you know i'm i'm glad i'm glad to know you yes you know um for many reasons, like Joe said at the beginning, you're, you know, a beautiful human being and, you know, I'm I'm just glad that you are a part of our community now. And Oh, well, you're sweet. Can, Thank you. <laughs> I can, I can say, you know, now, I, now I know a trans person and, I, and I'm honored. Yeah. You know, absolutely. Same here. Well, I appreciate that. And I would just, um, the only thing I would say, you know, um, is thank you for those for those kind things. Um, but I would also encourage you to, you know, just, you know, at your leisure, casually branch out as you're looking for different voices to listen to and to learn better from. I would, of course, um, you know, I guess what I'm saying is I'm one of the, in my opinion, one of the more privileged um, trans women, you know, and in terms of there's a whole lot of other trans people that, um, you know, are, are not white. So they don't benefit from white privilege. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. they are not gainfully employed. They are, you know, um, they, they don't have any social support. I mean, I think about all of the people who live in rural areas or areas where, um, you know, bias and, and bigotry runs rampant. I've, I've lived in those places in my life. I, I, I grew up in the South and there's lots of pockets of those types of places. Um, and yeah. the South is more heterogeneous than most people would, I think, um, like to say in their cliches and in their stereotypes. And I will acknowledge that. I mean, there are definitely blue, very blue pockets in the South and very blue areas. And there's places where trans people and LGBT people can survive and thrive even. But I also know what it's like, you know, before I moved to my current position and I lived in the South, I was driving 60 miles one way to see the only doctor that would treat me, even after going to um, a therapist. And in fact, there was only one therapist in my town who would speak to me about trans, about trans issues and about gender dysphoria and stuff like that. The others told me that you know, they didn't believe in that or that they didn't want to do that or it wasn't something they felt comfortable doing. And so basically you're turning one of the more vulnerable populations, a person from one of the more vulnerable populations away from being supported. Mm -hmm. So 
I could go on and on just about my experiences about living in, in, you know, a place where it's, it's really hostile towards, <laughs> you know, trans healthcare and just LGBTQ yeah. people in general. But I think, um, you know, having, having support is important. And I know that there's a lot of people, um, who definitely have more, um, stories to tell than, than, you know, a white, privileged, um, educated professor um, type person in the community. But again, I try to use what I have as best I can. And I try to listen and I've listened to those voices and I try to direct my energy to, to lift the tide, so to speak. Um, yeah. So hopefully I'm doing a good job. I'm, I'm, I'm trying. <laughs> I see a lot of opportunity and I see a lot of humans in my life every day who, you know, I'm able to advocate to just by being an open trans woman. I, I, I almost have, have stopped um, presenting very much with, for example, my hairpiece. Um, mm-hmm. And that's a big deal. I mean, that's a big deal, believe it or not, because, mm-hmm. um, you know, hair is a big signifier in terms of the way people have their unconscious assessment of who you are. And um, in our society, a big part of that assessment is gender, especially for cisgender people. Mm-hmm. Um, and so given that, you know, I, I basically just, you know, wear a head wrap uh, and stuff like that. And um I'm, you know, whenever I interviewed for my current position, I did so um, by being completely transparent and saying, hey, this is this is me. And I want you to know that because if you want me to come here, I want you to stand behind me. I want to have your support. I want to be a um, safe space and a beacon for for hope for other LGBTQ people on campus who may need um, some support. And that's awesome. Mm -hmm. You know, that's awesome that that you do that and that you put yourself out there and that, you know, when you want to get the position that you have, that you, you know, you put it all out there, you put it on your sleeve and said, this is me, you know, take it or leave it, like it or not. This is who who I am and I'm not going to hide that for anybody. And that is such courage. Mm-hmm. You know, it's so strong, and it's I I admire it. Um, I, I I don't have any words. It's just it's awesome. It's mm-hmm. just cool. Yeah. Well, thank you. No, I appreciate it. And and again, this is another one of those things where you know I turned. Um, well, I should say I will be turning um, forty one years old this year, and Happy you know I sp- I spent a lot <laughs> of my life again, sort of you know without social life and there's detriment to that, but also um, with a lot of insulation and um, you know, whenever you pass as a cis white male in, in our current day and age, then um, you can, you're afforded the right to insulate yourself and to be quiet and to not have friends and to do whatever you want to. And so, you know, I, I have to say I was extraordinarily successful. People think that, in fact, I often tell my students this, people think that, you know, like, oh, wow, you are just, you are something else. Look at all these wonderful things you have done, these scientific accomplishments. I mean, you know, I've, I've, I've had a really good run at um, the technical aspects of my life and by employing my technical capabilities and my training and things like that to, to make things better. Um, and all I would say about that is, you know, I often tell my students, well, you'd be amazed at how much you can accomplish when you don't want to take any time and be with yourself because you're scared of ultimately what you're going to find out. Yeah. And so, you know, a lot of my accomplishments, whether it was, you know, um, going to grad school or getting, you know, funding um, or getting a faculty position or whatever it may be, um, a lot of those things were a product of running. And in fact, it was two years after I got to my first faculty position that things really started to fall apart. And, um, mm-hmm so badly that that you know my ex-wife um 
really was the one who came to me and, you know, sort of figured this out and um, opened up the, the, the chest that needed to be opened and looked at, the, the one that had all the things in it that I was running from. And mm-hmm. it's a long and really um, difficult story to talk about how those things got put in that chest. Um, the short of it is, and I, and I, and I say this because I think this is a very important thing to, to raise, um, in a conversation like this, you know, I was, I was eight years old the first time that I made mention of this to, to anyone in my family. And so you can imagine how in, um, you know, the, the culture of the eighties, first of all, um, mm-hmm. Second of all, the culture of being in the South and things like that and, and the different ways, that, you know, again, like I said, that South is more heterogeneous than, than most people would have you believe. But at the same time, there's also those stereotypes for a reason. Yeah. And and so that being said, you know, I think that, it, you know, it's taken me a long time in my life to especially since coming out and and um grabbing on to these things and realizing I had to process them for good mental health. Um, you know, I try not to hold any animosity or anger or residual feelings like that to, to the folks who um, had their way whenever I was younger to see to it um, almost as their duty that I grew into a cisgender male. And there were mm-hmm. many different ways that that they used to accomplish that. Um, some of them very horrific. Um, and I think, though, that, you know, at that point in time, I don't even think those folks knew about trans people or that they existed or anything. And especially thinking back to some of the things that that were said to me. Um, it it, it almost seemed like it was more directed toward making sure I wasn't going to be gay, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so that being said, uh, you know, um, it, it takes a lot, um, to, to sort of wake up to all of that one day and have it sitting on your door. And, and if, if I could lead that into this conversation, I would say that that's why it's so important for us to do self care and to be reflective and deal with our feelings, our traumas, our, our different, um, you know, immediate responses versus responses that are measured and thought out, you know, because so many people in our community deal with mental health challenges as a result of trauma. And if I could do anything, I would just, I would try to offer to folks the tools that I have, you know, developed. And I I say that intentionally. I mean, you have to develop and sharpen and forge these tools to, you know, for your own specific mental health challenges, because we're all, they all present so subtly differently to everybody. Um, so, and, and I would just say the one thing I would leave with that is that it really has come down to me for one thing, and that's been attitude. Um, I started out talking about how, you know, I'll be 41 um, this year. And so, you know, I've lived a life in a way. I have three children. Um, I, you know, and, and personal fulfillment aside, I've done a lot of good things. I've raised good humans, I believe. I have... Um, <laughs> You know, I've made some PhDs in this world. I've, um, you know, contributed to environmental remediation and, you know, high-tech environmental strategies for a sustainable future. I've contributed to materials for biomedical research. I've done all sorts of, of wonderful things. And so I'm still on the fence about how much, you know, my attitude about this right now is really just more of a, defense mechanism about accepting that I'm, I may just be lonely and, um, you know, not have very much, um, fulfillment to come in the future because of how late all of this came on with me. So I spend a lot of my time trying to encourage younger people, um, to encourage parents to affirm and protect their trans kids. 
so that they don't have to go through the similar type things that I did and have to, you know, repress this and, and hold it back. And, and society, again, society does a very good job of reinforcing your own denial um, as a trans person who is um, still unaware of being trans yourself. So maybe it's a product of my own trauma, but I try to I try to find value in myself and I try to find value in what I do just by helping other people because, you know, right or wrong, I'm just trying to be honest and speak from the heart. Right. I don't, yeah. I don't know that I have a lot of hope for myself because I just feel kind of, you know, like a lot of my life is kind of past now. Um, and that's unfortunate, but it's okay too. It's okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and but so you- my attitude was inspired by one thing I'll leave here with this. Um, there was something I read when I was 18 years old that someone gave me and it's, it's, I'm sure you could type it in on Google and it would pull it right up. Um, it's by a guy named Charles Swindle and it's called attitude. And the last part of it really, really resonated with me for, for a long time still does. Um, you know, I am convinced that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. And so it is with you we're all in charge of our attitudes. And so it really gave me an, a good shape on my perspective as a late teen who was trying to, you know, move through a bunch of dramatic experiences as an early teen and just accept that, okay, if these things happened, they happened. There's nothing I can do to unhappen them. The only thing I can do is move forward and try and be a good source of light and a good source of humanity to this world. So, yeah. Well, I think that you're doing that. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 100%. Um, you know, sh- should we take our break? Cause, I yeah, mean, let's take our break real quick because uh, okay. that's kind of our thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, fine. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's I great. I wasn't, I wasn't sure. I hate to I hate to take a break from it, but um, suddenly it's a it's a really good idea, and I'm I'm not going to mention why, um, <laughs> but let's just say there's a bathroom involved. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> okay, sure, yeah, we're gonna whatever. Listening, we're going to be listening to "Thrill of the Chase" by Hayden Joseph. Uh, so you guys stay tuned. Give that a listen. And we will catch you on the other side of it. Thanks for tuning in. This was fun. I hope we do it again. But make me wait a while before giving in. Cause if it's too easy.
education's a perfect reputation to keep us on the edge of our seats. They don't need a million dollars or labels on their collars. That ain't how our interests are peaked. Welcome back to Voices for Change 2.0. I'm Joe, and the beautiful, lovely, wonderful woman sitting next to me on my right is my lovely wife, Rebecca. Say hi, Rebecca. Say hi, Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca. I love you. <laughs> I just set it right up there, and you knocked it off the tee. Yep. So, And the wonderful woman that we are talking to on the line is Dr. Emmy J. How you doing? Hey, I'm doing good. I I got my um I got my my whistle wet again and um yeah, good to go. Good. Awesome. So, we've been having a great conversation uh this whole time and one thing that I wanted to ask is what types of self-care do you practice? Well, that's a really good question. Um you know, I've had to adapt so much um during this pandemic too, you know, to, to what I normally would have considered and, and sort of what I got into as a routine for self care, which involved things like going to the, to the park and taking a walk and, and things like that, which, you know, I think we can do that now here. Um, but for a while, even that was prohibited. Um, mm-hmm. so for me, you know, I find strength, as I said before, um, earlier in the conversation in, in my routine and in being able to go and have coffee with, with my friends that I like to sit and, and talk philosophical with, um, whether it's about mental health or, you know, being trans or being human or whatever it may be. Um, Mm -hmm. so recently, uh, what I've had to do is, um, some days I have actually put makeup on so that I would have to take it off. If that makes (laughs) sense. (laughs) Um, just to get me to yeah. do my routine, you know, just to get me to, to to go through my routine in the morning and sort of, you know, and I, and I, and I admit it, it does give me a little bit, um, sense of, you know, control over things and control over my emotional disposition of the day. Um, but that gets me, you know, of course, um, in the bathroom doing basic self care and, and um, taking care of the hygienic parts of things, um, moisturizing my face and not letting it just dry out, which, Mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately, I hate to say it, it's it's very easy for me to do. Um, It's it's been a a very difficult inertia to overcome um, the compounded nature of what the pandemic is doing to my mental health as a trans person. And I would say that, you know, um, trans, being trans is, you know, I'm still trans during a pandemic. Um, It's not a choice. It's not a lifestyle choice. I don't, I don't, I don't want to be trans. I don't, I don't want to be a woman. I don't want to be any of this. I just am. It's the hand that I have, that I was dealt with. Um, It took me a long time to accept that hand and to play that hand. But now that I have it and and I've accepted that, it's definitely made it, um, it made me appreciate the hand that I have more and um, own it and do, do, you know, a lot of my research in my life has been biological, biological related, 
And so a lot of, I, I have a, a, a pretty vast knowledge of biochemistry, biomolecular science, um, human biology, all sorts of different things like that. And, you know, a big part of my self-care is, you know, initially it was learning about myself as a trans person. You know, what do we know about trans people? Well, we know at this point um, through the various types of um, medical, physiological, anatomical, and sociological research that's been done that, you know, trans people and LGBTQ people in general have really been around as humans as long as humans have been around. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, there are, there are fundamental drivers of human biology that lead to divergences in what we would consider the quote unquote statistical norm of being a human, whether that's, you know, cisgender, heterosexual, um, able-bodied, um, reproductively capable, you know, all of these types of things is what I think from an evolutionary biology standpoint, um, all of those types of things um, are very natural and, and normal. And if we could draw out a template and we, you know, allow the system that we interface this three-dimensional physical reality through to be um, simple and not personified as quote unquote a God, then we see this machinery at work that leads to these divergences as being, you know, natural and a normal quote unquote, a normal occurrence in this species. So for me, self care a lot of times has to do with um, reminding myself of that and reminding myself that, you know, I was dealt this hand and lots of other people before me have been dealt this hand Lots of people after me will be dealt this hand, and there's not really much that any humans, no matter how bad they may want to, can do about that. And there's a bit of solace and inner peace for me in, in having these sorts of ruminations and conversations with myself um, just about my own existence, because a lot of times, if I'm being frank, um, it's the challenges of just the hand I was dealt that that presents mental health, um, mental health thorns, let's call them. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's definitely, it, it, you know, one goes hand in hand with the other almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I think, um, you know, I think that, for a long time, one of the reasons that one of the things that kept me in denial was this, you know, idea that um, there was these all these ideas, I should say, of what being trans is not. And, mm -hmm. you know, I always kind of felt like, well, I, I don't see myself in that. I don't understand that. And that seems so strange and foreign. That can't be me. Um, so there's. I, I know it seems like a bit of an abstract answer and, and I can give you more tangible things, but, but really there's power in that. There's power in just feeling like you fit as a person in this species and that your existence, the way it is, is, is okay. And it's part of this, you know, process, this, this experience we call life that we all exist within. So on one hand, there's this idea of, you know, living with myself, you know, living as a trans woman, you know, wh whether it's gender dysphoria or, you know, being dissatisfied about certain things about my body or about, you know, whatever it may be about, you know, all of that stuff is internal. And the self-care for that is recognizing that I am valid. Now, there's a whole other host of mental health challenges, and in fact, this is one of the things that I hoped I could, I could talk about a little bit today, is mm -hmm. there's, this, there, there's one side of the coin that is all of the internal challenges to our mental health about being trans, and then there's also these external challenges to our mental health about, you know, that, that really come from society's lack of understanding or lack of acceptance or lack of you know, courtesy, just common courtesy and benefit, what I call the benefit of the doubt. Um, mm -hmm. You know, whenever somebody tells you something who is cisgender or, or let's say that somebody that falls within that quote unquote statistical normal mode that 
that template person, you know, the cisgender, heterosexual, able-bodied, monogamous. There's all these different types of labels that we can give that, Mm -hmm. you know, just based on the existence of this many humans, we would look at from a statistical perspective and say, well, that's quote unquote normal. And so, you know, being somebody who inherently, by the way, I was born diverges from that norm. You know, there's a whole lot of externalities that get compounded on top of the own internal challenges that we have just to face with being trans. And so a lot of self-care for me is trying to be body positive. I don't, mm. I don't feel like my body is the wrong body. I just feel like my body is a trans body. Um, mm-hmm. I do the best I can with what I have. It goes back to that idea of attitude. Now, you know, okay, here's some simple um, sound bites for you. I like <laughs> cooking. I love cooking. Okay, now maybe that's my chemistry training too, but I was also told you never trust a chemist who can't cook. So you've got me on both <laughs> sides there. Okay. Um, I like to um, listen to music really loud, which oh. at 40, almost 41 is not probably the best thing I should be doing. Um, I like playing I'm games 40, with my kids. I'm go 46 ahead, ahead, and I still, <laughs> I'm 46 and I still listen to music really loud. So it's, you're not alone. It's helpful. Yeah, it's yeah. a good coping strategy for some things, you know. It just allows you to mm-hmm. resonate it out. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. But playing with my kids is a big thing, you know, uh, talking to them, trying to just, you know, teach them about life. That's a, that's a good self-care thing because, you know, and again, maybe this is just back to me trying to validate my own existence through helping others. But either way, it does help. Um, I want to mm-hmm. make good humans that go forth and, and make this world hopefully a little bit better. Um And then there's making coffee. I I also love to make coffee as self-care. I I used to do espresso for about 12 years, and now I've gone Mm. to percolating. So I'm a bit of a coffee-savvy, you know, um, roaster person, I guess. (laughs) Hey, you know what? There's absolutely nothing wrong with that either. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I enjoy a good cup of coffee now and again, and – you know, you can you can tell when someone's taking their time and put their care into it versus somebody just slaps something together and you're drinking, you know, brown water. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. That's good. So, that's good. So there's there's a talent to it. Um and don't let anybody tell you different. You know? <laughs> yes, sir, that's right. Yeah. So yeah, no, I, I uh you, you you definitely speak to me on the on the loud music part of it. I've uh, been <laughs> I've I've been playing guitar for over uh, was it over thirty years, babe? Mm-hmm. And uh, it's so long, it's so long I can't remember. And you know I'm not happy unless I've got loud guitars and loud amplifiers and some hearing loss. So, yes, yes, <laughs> you yes. know what I mean. So I do. Uh, so that's, I do. That's me. You know. Um, you know. I want I wanted to ask uh, because we're you know we're we're the show's winding down a little bit, but I wanted to ask you, um, what is your advice for a young person who may be struggling with their gender identity or sexual identity? Wow. That's, that's a great question. Um, so relevant. Um, so, you know, I had someone who served a little bit as a mentor to me, um, right after I came out to myself, um, and so, so I had a little bit different, you know, my, my second acceptance of this was, you know, I spent a couple of years literally trying to um, position myself and plan accordingly and figure out a way to do this that minimized harm and, you know, potential harassment and that kind of stuff for me, for my family, for, you know, just, just all around. So mm-hmm. I took I took a bit of a different approach in that regard, and I think that that's okay, you know, for especially for me, um, someone who came out um, later in life with sort of an established, you know, career, family, and this type of stuff. It gave me again that insulation to be able to sit around and do that. Um, and the first thing that I would suggest is reach out to online communities. Um, and find people whose experiences overlap with your own. There's so much power in just talking to other people 
in your community who have experienced things similar to you, there's some sort of empathy um, response that's generated there. And, you know, I've formed bonds with, um, you know, some trans women over the few years I've been around Twitter, for example, um, that are, you know, I think lifelong bonds. Um, and it, and it comes down to that ability to instantly relate and empathize with each other and overlap. And those are very, very special type bonds to me that, that I formed, but you know, that's what I did. My first step once I accepted things with myself was to start a social media page and go from there and just try to find trans people so that, you know, the information that I got about myself wasn't just strictly from a medical or science perspective or wasn't just strictly from a, you know, blog perspective or a single um, trans person's perspective. It gave me an ability to sort of expand my horizons about what the transgender experience really was to other people. So maybe maybe going back to that humanizing element, except it did it for mm-hmm. myself. So so that was a big deal for me. Um, second, I would suggest reaching out and trying to find local communities um, so that you can have real in-person support. Um, you know, I have talked to so many people who benefit so much from the communities, um, the LGBTQ community, um, whether it's group therapy meetings or whether it's, you know, here we have a bingo night sometimes. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's just reasons to get together and, and share in our common lived experience without ever even talking about it, you know, just kind of sharing in our presence. Um And then third, you know, and this is where I would advocate strongest. I I really believe that, and I wrote something about this not long ago. I have a Mm -hmm. real challenge getting students um, to come to office hours because there's this stigma around office hours that, you know, if you go to office hours, that must mean that you, you know, aren't smart enough to, to get it on your own or something like that. And, Mm -hmm. um, I see a lot of the same sort of stigma and, and um, you know, defensive responses to, to mental health and self-care and stuff like that. So I think that high-quality mental health um, therapeutics should be freely available to, to um, you know, citizens of the United States, like most other developed countries in the world. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so, 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 so I guess what I'm saying is that I, I strongly advocate for finding someone, a therapist of sort that you can talk to and in that sort of confidential, uh, confidential space in a, in a space where they are able to, you know, especially if they have experience in this regard. Um, But at the very least, they can give you broad and general healing tools and help you forge those healing tools that that I started out earlier talking about. Um, So so I want to be sensitive to the fact that, number one, you know, not everybody has access to quality mental health care. And that is tragic. And I think it needs to change. And I think it's a very, very huge shortcoming for our country. Number two, I also know that even those who have access to mental health care oftentimes have to go through several iterations of different therapists because, you know, unfortunately, and probably fortunately, not every person, not every therapist is a cookie cutter, um, you know, sort of template of what a trans person is going to, or a specific unique trans person is going to benefit from. So what also I've noticed in my conversations with people in my community is that they struggle with this idea of, well, I did go out and sought out a therapist and, you know, they had no clue what they were doing. They misgendered me. They, you know, all of these types of things where they had no sensitivity to our actual issues and so what that what I find most and that makes me seriously disappointed and, and upset is that a lot of those people who do go through the process of seeking out that help sort of give up because, you know, they can't find quality health care. Not just health care, mm-hmm. but quality health care that speaks yeah, to their that's needs. The hard part. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's mm-hmm. that. It's funny that you mentioned those three things because, you know, those are not unique to the trans community. Uh, I, and I, I sucks Absolutely. having to say that, but you know, it, you, what you just described was our 20 year history with Beck's mental health struggles, mm-hmm. believe yeah. it or not. Yeah. Um, finding quality care, finding, you know, a psychiatrist or a therapist that will listen, having to go through multiple, multiple doctors and whatnot until you find the the one that can really help you. You know, uh, this, this goes back to what I said at the very beginning of the show about, you know, we have to take an active interest in our own care, you know, in our, yeah. our own, our own medical, you know, I, I think for the trans community, it's it's probably, you know, more so with trying to find the proper mm-hmm. resources. You know, it's it's mm-hmm. so much harder, and mm-hmm. you know, my my heart breaks, you know, for for the trans community for that because I know I know how hard it was for us, and it just oh, and you're yeah. absolutely right. We we need to get on the ball with the rest of the you know, civilized world when it comes to healthcare. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I agree with you 110%. And, you know, so, you know what? I think in the meantime, get somebody I think in, in there the meantime, that, you know. Well, I think the best thing we can do in the meantime, and that feeds right back into the first thing that I said is, you know, I almost, I actually almost tweeted something about this the other day, how, you know, I notice. So many trans people in the Twitter trans community doing therapy for each other. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, in in some ways, in some ways, we're not qualified as therapists, but what we are qualified as is trans people. And what what we can relate to is, you know, those overlapping experiences and finding people who are ahead of us on the curve who have forged those tools and sharpened those tools and can offer advice about how they got there. You know, that's, that's part of the reason I stay around trans Twitter. You know, I mean, I originally Mm -hmm. came because I was curious, like how, what does being trans mean? What is all this? And then after about a year or so, I was kind of on my way and um, I made a decision that, well, maybe it's good if I just stay here, if I go ahead and, and show my face and stop being an avatar and I go ahead and make this a little bit more real so that people who come here in the same boat that I did, you know, they'll find me at least. And, and I try to keep my messaging mostly positive. It's hard to, whenever you have transphobic people who spend a lot of time every day advocating against people like me, you know, even though, Mm -hmm. You know, people like me have been around legally using spaces and all this kind of stuff for decades, literal decades. And now all of a sudden, you know, gay marriage goes into effect. Sort of, it was this whole idea that a lot of the evangelical conservatives and right wing people lost the battle on the front of gay marriage and, you know, homosexual rights and things like that. And so, really, a lot of the ire and attention has really been hammered to trans people over this past you know, decade or whatever, because they see it almost as um, one last place to come and hammer division into the community. And we all know that when we can divide a community, we can conquer that community. And so Mm -hmm. one of the biggest things that I see that's, you know, so disheartening for me is whenever you find, for example, you know, LGB folks who are, you know, transphobic and anti-trans rights and such you know and it's like this attitude of well I've got mine but what I think they miss in the bigger picture is the fact that you know once these people the the same people who they're allying with against trans people are the same ones that they were fighting against very short time ago so I don't know there's a little short-sightedness there but overall what I would say is you know come to Find you a community somewhere online. Um, find you some people with related experiences. And if the very best you can get is to have a community, a small community of people who can share their tools with you, then I think that's worthy. That's absolutely. A, absolutely. And that's a, that's a great note for us to uh, end on. 
unfortunately. I, I hate to, to call it on the show, but, you know, the end is near. <laughs> so Yeah, no, that's we, fine. Thank you so much for having me on. I so appreciate it. Oh, it's been our pleasure, Emmy. Uh, thank you so, so much for taking the time with uh, with being with us and we would absolutely love to have you back um to to talk more about this because i know we we just scratched the surface you know and i, I realize okay. that and you know you're such a lovely person and uh we're beck and i are both honored to call you our friend um so what we want you to do is uh stay on the line and uh everybody else you're going to be listening to this is who we are by blake mciver and We'll see you guys next week. Stay healthy. Stay happy. Stay home. Wear a mask. <laughs> Don't take yes, any wooden please. nickels. Don't eat spinach with the <laughs> Goodbye. Pulling past the signpost of this tiny weather town. The tears welled up so high inside. I thought that I might drown. Everything different. But it all looked the same And now you're here beside me And I'm rid of all my shame I just hope that they will see What has always been in me How much do I love you? Rain.